really started the war between Georgia and Russia, an exclusive investigation. Tonight, first-hand accounts of Georgian aggression against its own civilians in the conflict that brought Europe to the edge of a new Cold War. Tim Hewell is the first Western journalist to be given unrestricted access to South Ossetia, the flashpoint for the summer's war. He's been told of civilians being targeted and human rights abuses. They wanted to burn us alive in this building. We put the allegations to the Georgian president. We strongly deny any of this, any accusation of war crimes. But of course, you know, we are very open for any kind of comments. We are very open for any kind of investigation. Bad taste, stupid. Isn't that what viewers and listeners of Russell Brand want? So why has this obscenity row become so big? And a week to go, is it possible for an American president to win too well? We'll explain. Good evening. We have a disturbing report from the flashpoint of this summer's war between Georgia and Russia, which led to talk of the revival of the Cold War. Georgia, which seeks NATO membership and boasts about its democracy, claimed that Russia planned and launched an attack. Moscow disputes this. Whatever the exact series of events, Newsnight's Tim Huell is the first Western journalist to secure unfettered access to South Ossetia. He heard eyewitness accounts that Georgian troops engaged in human rights abuses, including shelling a sleeping city and deliberately bombarding undefended apartment blocks. We'll hear the Georgian side in a moment from the president himself. First, here's Tim's exclusive report from South Ossetia and its main town, Skin Valley, in a region which some fear could start off World War III. Just before midnight, one Thursday in early August, a barrage of rockets and shells was unleashed on a small town in the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia. It came from the country's own government, determined to reconquer a rebel stronghold. But the rockets didn't just hit rebels. They hit many ordinary houses including the one that was Tyre Sitnik's home. This is what used to be our stairwell. We were hiding in the basement down here. Tyre and her son Georgi rushed down here from her upstairs flat in Skinvali when the bombardment started at half past 11 on the night of the 7th of August. We were watching TV. The firing started not from machine guns, but from heavy artillery. We sat here and thought it would finish, but it got ever stronger. There were loud shell explosions. You couldn't get out onto the street or upstairs. We thought that in the morning it would quieten down, but the firing didn't stop. On the morning of the second day, a fragment of a tank shell hit her son in the neck. He bled to death in her arms. This is where my son's blood was. The neighbours have cleared it up now. They wanted to burn us alive in this building. Mobile phone footage shows the Georgians using notoriously inaccurate grad rockets and taking their tanks through the streets. This is what the tanks did to Tyre's building. Two of them, she says, fired into every floor from just yards away. Her flat, less damaged than many, is now a memorial to her only son. Georgi was just 21. He was a dentist. Here's his mask. I brought his last photos. I held him in my arms. I closed my son's eyes. How can that be, for a mother to close her own dead son's eyes?
Tsinvali, the focus of Georgia's attack, is the size of a small English market town. But it's the capital of a territory, South Ossetia, that broke away from Georgia nearly 20 years ago. Georgia says the Ossetians, backed by their ally Russia, used Srinvali as a base for ever more frequent attacks on surrounding Georgian villages. It says that's why, finally, on August the 7th, it counter-attacked. But the opposite Ossetian version of events has barely been heard in the West. I've come to find out what they experienced on August the 7th and the days that followed. Tsinvali hasn't been levelled to the ground, as the Russians claimed during the war, but houses that are still standing are often badly damaged inside. What's striking is how much destruction the Georgians inflicted in just a couple of days, and destruction mainly of ordinary homes. For the Ossetians, that constitutes a crime against humanity that the world has closed its eyes to. The world concentrated instead on what happened next, the invasion of South Ossetia and other parts of Georgia by the Ossetians' mighty allies, the Russians. The West was outraged. There was a tit for tat. I think the Georgian action was reckless. I think the Russian response was disproportionate and wrong. And that is the series of events that have landed us where we are. The rights and the wrongs both of each side's actions need to be investigated, but they mustn't occlude the fact that a neighbour with 800,000 people in uniform then invaded a sovereign country that's recognised as part of the United Nations. In Gori, a Georgian town outside South Ossetia, the Russians occupied what was a brand new military base, newly equipped to NATO standards. The footage ordinary Russian soldiers took on their mobiles reveals their wide-eyed fury at the Georgian enemy's superior conditions. Russia deliberately trashed this base to weaken Georgia militarily and to punish the country for its growing ties with NATO. And indeed, Georgians believe that it was to accomplish those objectives that Russia started the whole war in the first place. So who was to blame for the outbreak of war? In the Georgian capital, Tbilisi, they say they can prove it was the Russians. And Huel, names are Sturdy and Huel. Uh, Sturdy and Huel. They're taking me to their top secret monitoring centre, where evidence collected by this operative is at the heart of the debate. It's the tape of a phone call between two Ossetian border guards, apparently confirming that Russia began the war. One guard reports that a Russian armoured column has passed through the tunnel from Russia onto Georgian sovereign territory. What's crucial is the timing. The Georgians say the call was made at 3.25 a.m., some 20 hours before their attack. In the Georgian Interior Ministry, a senior official played me the recording. But despite this apparent evidence, Georgia didn't mention any Russian invasion when it went to war at the end of that day, the 7th. It didn't mention any proof until weeks later, because it says now it mislaid the tape. So even though this tape was so important, as evidence of, of Russia's actions, you actually lost it for a month. Um, well, we we had we never lost it actually because it was it was in the files. But the, uh, we had about six thousand intercepts of the same kind. But this was so a crucial. This was moment. yeah. This was crucial. So even one so important yeah. to your case, you didn't keep it specially, separately. No, no, no. And that was a mistake. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, isn't convinced. 
This tape uh, is, is nonsense and it is a lie. Look, NATO with all, and the United States with all the satellites monitoring this area very, very closely. How can they uh, not know the truth? They know it and we know that they know it. Russia claims its army first crossed the border at the Rocky Tunnel on August the 8th, the day after the Georgian attack on Skinvali. I arrived by the same route, the first Western journalist since the war to be given unrestricted access to South Ossetia. If Georgia were right about the timing, Russian troops would have poured down this road from the 7th of August onwards. But our driver, Alan Parastayev, an Ossetian who came this way on the morning of the 8th, says he saw no troops at all. That's why the panic was in South Ossetia and in Trinval as well. And even some of the authorities said that the, 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 the Russians betrayed us and they don't want to help us anymore. In Trinvali, Ossetians say they had to fight the Georgians alone. That makes them all the prouder of the spoils of war. The top of this Georgian tank was blown off, not by Russians, but by local Ossetian volunteers. The Russians don't seem to have been in the town for most of the time that it was occupied by Georgians. Indeed, according to everyone we've spoken to here, the main body of Russian forces didn't arrive for more than two days after the initial Georgian attack. Far from having carefully planned their invasion, as Georgia has suggested, it seems the Russians had to scramble to get organised. Their intelligence was so poor that when they finally approached Skinvali on the 9th of August, their advance column drove straight into a Georgian ambush, a defeat witnessed by a Russian reporter who was himself wounded. A Georgian ran up. I was dressed in black jeans, an ordinary green jumper with a hood. And I said to him, we're journalists. He shouted back, we're killers, and fired a grenade. Only five armoured vehicles got away. The rest of the column was wiped out and there were a lot of wounded, including the army commander, General Khrulyov. From a military point of view, the commander of an army has no business in an advanced column coming to storm a town. But journalists weren't the only non-military target hit that day. It's alleged that the Georgians continued firing, intentionally or not, on ordinary civilians. It's destroyed. Look at the shells they used. Clearly not machine gun. Look, they were large shells. This was Marina Kochieva's car. She alleges it was hit repeatedly by Georgian tank fire as she tried to flee Trinvali on the night of August the 9th. They crashed into a ditch, but the firing didn't stop. My fellow passenger covered me with his body and he was hit. If he hadn't been hit, the bullet would have been for me. You were driving fast and, and it was night time. Maybe they simply thought that you were fighters. Fighters go towards the fighting, and we were escaping. They knew that this road is a bypass and leads to the north. So they were lying in wait for people like me, people who were frightened, who were weak, who were fleeing the fighting. They didn't allow us that. Only thanks to God's help did we survive. But lots died on this road. Ossetians wounded in the war were patched up in a makeshift underground hospital. The international investigative organisation Human Rights Watch now accuses Georgia of indiscriminate use of force in Trinvali, a violation of the Geneva Conventions. It believes it may also be guilty of deliberate targeting of civilians, a serious war crime. What does Georgia's ally, Britain, think of that? On my visit to Tbilisi, of course I raised, at the highest level in Georgia, the questions that have been asked and raised about war crimes and other military actions by the Georgian authorities. 
Russia puts it very simply, it says Georgia attacked a sleeping town. Well, Georgia was attacked by people in that town of Sink Skin Valley. And that is the tit for tat that I have talked about from the beginning. There is another side to the story, and this is it. The wholesale destruction after the war of ethnic Georgian villages inside South Ossetia by Ossetian militia. Ossetians say the villages were used by the Georgian military. But this was plainly a family home. Its former occupants are now among the 16,000 Georgian refugees from South Ossetia, sheltering on the other side of the dividing line. It's hard to believe that the Georgian family who lived here will ever be allowed to return. The destruction of this house and hundreds of others is a deliberate act of ethnic cleansing. In Srinvali, I met one of the perpetrators. It was not cleansing. There wasn't any genocide of the Georgian people. No one was killed. They were given a corridor so that they could calmly get out of there. When they'd left their villages, their houses were burnt so they didn't return. It's enough just to set light to the curtains and the whole house will flare up. If you ever want to burn someone's house, that's my advice. Simply set light to the curtains and that's enough. By the time those houses were burned, Russian troops had finally arrived in force, driving the Georgians out of South Ossetia. But the Russians failed to prevent the willful destruction of civilian property. No, this, this is not uh, ethnic cleansing. This was also the, the area of the, of the war. The Georgians, when I say that the Georgians were moving their artillery and tanks closer to Tsienval, uh, this also included the Georgian enclaves inside South Ossetia, where they secretly organized uh, strongholds. But w w we've talked, for example, to Ossetian militiamen who talked about how they burnt and destroyed those houses after the immediate conflict. Shouldn't Russia somehow have prevented that from happening? Uh, well, of course, when, when uh, your city is attacked, when your uh, loved ones, when your relatives, when your children, when your parents, brothers and sisters are being killed brutally, you, you can go emotional and you can go really uh, in, a very, in a very unwanted way. But while Russia's forgiving of its Ossetian allies, has the West overlooked possible crimes by its Georgian partners? The phrase tit for tat doesn't in some way, you don't think, diminish what appears to be at least partly indiscriminate action against civilians. Tit for tat implies fighters. Well, tit for tat, military tit for tat, is people attacking each other and trying to kill each other. And so you may think that is not a serious description. I think it is a serious description. And at no stage have we belittled any of the suffering or the death that has been caused. What I think is important is that whatever the dispute between South Ossetians and Georgians, whatever the rights and wrongs of what each of them did, and I've talked at every stage about wrongs as well as rights, that does not justify one country invading another. <laughs> this is where my son was buried, here. He was killed on the 9th of August at about 10 a.m. We buried him on the 10th. They killed him. Caught in the tit for tat, neither Taya nor her son Georgi were trying to kill anyone. And for her, the eventual arrival of the Russians meant she could finally emerge from the cellar to make a temporary grave for him here. An Ossetian view of the conflict is summed up by a neighbour who stops me as I leave. I bow down before the great Russian people. Thank you for everything. We don't know how many Ossetian civilians were killed in the fighting. Human Rights Watch estimates between three and 400. In Srinvali, that would be 1% of the population, the equivalent of 70,000 deaths in London. If many of them did die, as appears, from indiscriminate force, that's a war crime no less real for being committed by a firm ally of the West.
Tim Heal reporting. Well, earlier I talked with the president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, and began by asking him if he regretted the civilian deaths caused by Georgian troops. Well, I, I regret every single death uh, as a result of uh, military hostilities. Um, this was not a uh, war of our choice. Uh, whether it was hunted or as much as it was, even if it had been as one single person, it would have been very tragic for me, certainly. Certainly, I do regret it. You personally took the decision to attack what we were told was a sleeping town, Skin Valley. Civilian deaths were an inevitable part of your policy, were they not? We took a uh, decision and we had uh, basically no choice to protect our population from attacking and advancing Russian military equipment from uh, Russian-backed and uh, basically Russian-trained, uh, Russian-equipped and Russian-commanded militias, as well as regular Russian troops that invaded my country. Uh, I did, we did something that any other democ democratic government would have done. But we have heard evidence that civilians were killed when troops opened fire using artillery and tanks indiscriminately at people who were sleeping in tower blocks. That surely is wrong. We clearly, and I clearly, gave orders uh, to fire back only for at firing positions. Unfortunately, of course, uh, they were using for firing positions also some of the, uh, you know, they were using this town. But I have to mention that they preliminarily evacuated most of the civilian population from Tsin Valley, uh, preparing for these hostilities and invasion. And certainly, there was no intent on Georgia troops to fire on civilians. These are our citizens. Our troops are clearly trained to protect civilians. But these allegations are supported by human rights organisations like Human Rights Watch and they point to a pattern of deliberate abuse by Georgian forces under your command which could be equated with war crimes. Well, I mean, certainly we strongly deny any of this, any accusation of war crimes. But of course, you know, we are very open for any kind of comments. We are very open for any kind of investigation. We called indeed for international investigation into conduct of this war, into conditions leading to this war, into, into uh, circumstances leading to this invasion. Uh, and certainly, when you are talking about indiscriminate use of power, we, of fire, we have clear-cut evidence that the town of Tsukin Valley was shelled from dozens, dozens and maybe hundreds, but dozens we can prove there for this moment, but with video footage as well as documentary evidence from Russian army and from Russian journalists indeed, by Russian troops for several days. They were bombed sometimes simultaneously by 25 Russian planes at, at the time. At the same, at same time, you know, this small town was bombed by 25 planes that were in the air. And certainly it was, it was badly damaged. But I also have to say that, you know, and you know it as well, that those areas which were under Georgian control, and they were not ethnic Georgian villages, they were basically villages mostly predominantly populated by ethnic Ossetians, but they were affiliated with the Georgian government, were 100% destroyed. So, you know, there were certainly war crimes committed, certainly not by us, but certainly we want, and we demand the investigation of that war crimes, we demand that people who are responsible for those war crimes are brought to international justice, and we demand that all these circumstances are clarified that, so that we can defeat the whole, the incredible Orwellian machine of you know, disinformation that was put into action from the very first second of this military hostilities, of this invasion as well, or for the months and the years before leading to, those inv to this invasion. But are you worried that this will change the way in which the world sees you, not simply as a victim of Russian aggression, but as Georgian army attacking civilians? It changes the way the world will look on Georgia. More truth comes out. So far, more our case gets strengthened. And, uh, you know, the, initially, uh, it wasn't that clear-cut because Russians have prepared their case. Initially, Russia thought about, spoke about 2,000 people killed by Georgians. It was totally clearly repudiated by all the evidence on the ground. They talked about genocide. Clearly, it's not true, and everybody understands it now. They spoke about Georgian starting this war, and in fact, now we have hardcore evidence, clear evidence that Russians invaded not only a few days before it all started, but they've been there for 
months and years and provoking and initiating hostilities before that, doing clear, committing clear illegal acts. So, you know, we have interest in having transparency. Finally, Mr. President, the British Foreign Secretary David Miliband tells us that he's raised the alleged war crimes issue at the highest level in Tbilisi. What are you going to do about it? Well, we raised it with him as well. And uh, we, uh, we, we uh, certainly want, uh, we told the European Union we want uh, uh, serious uh, impartial international investigation. We want a uh, very serious uh, look at it uh, by international judicial bodies. Indeed, we brought the case to the Hague uh, International Court of Justice, and uh, we obtained injunction on Russia to stop the policy of ethnic cleansing. Russia has just thrown out 35,000 uh, people from there, and not ethnic Georgians, you know, most of them are predominantly ethnically Ossetian. Ethnic Ossetians uh, from the areas which we controlled previously fled from the Russians because they regard them as occupiers. But we also want to bring the case to International Court, uh, Criminal Court. We, we are very serious about it, and we will pursue it till the end, and we have nothing to hide. We are very open. President Saakashvili, thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Now, if you're fans of Russell 